think a lot of people can agree with the statement that math was probably one of their least favorite subjects growing up in school. Um, I was all right at math, but I didn't enjoy it because I didn't understand the practical application of it. It was all abstract, you know? What are numbers? They're just values that we give to things. But when math first began, it was for a very practical purpose. Uh, the furthest back we can trace general algebra is um, BC era um, Arabic regions. And they came up with it as a way of keeping track of how much they had and how much they owed other people. Now, it's easy to tell if you have two or three goats, but it's a bit harder by looking to see if you have 200 or 300. Um, and so they would keep track of things by counting with numbers. Um, and that was how they created algebra. And eventually they would say, I can group my goats into this many sets of however much. Um, I can group them into sets of 40. If I have three sets of 40, and that's how multiplication came into being. But they never had need of the number zero because you know if you have nothing. You, know, you can look out in a field and you don't have to count zero goats. Just look out, okay, yeah, that's still nothing. Um, they didn't need the number zero. In fact, the number zero is a very recent discovery. Um, it's traced back to, I want to say, 9th or 10th century, um, the Olmec civilization, which is a Native American civilization from South America. The Olmecs were the first people in history to have had a concept of the number zero. The first people to have notated the lack of something. Because it's kind of a silly idea to us. Or it's kind of a silly idea to other people. To us, it's kind of a granted idea. Zero is just something that's there. It's what comes before one. But zero was revolutionary when they first came up with it. And for a couple of reasons. One of them is the way we use zero today, which is as a placeholder. If I give you the number 324, that tells you that there are three hundreds, two tens, and four ones. If I give you the number 304, that tells us there are three hundreds and four ones. And there aren't any tens, but we can't just say 34 because that's a different number. So we put a zero in there to hold the place of the tens. Even though there's nothing there, we need a placeholder. A placeholder is quite literally something that takes a place that it doesn't deserve. Zero doesn't deserve to be there. It doesn't notate anything. It just goes there because we need something to be there. And so today, we're going to look at a character in the Bible that I think often gets overlooked. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at the character of Barabbas during the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, this lesson actually came from another lesson I prepared a long time ago that I called Vantage Point, which was looking at the crucifixion through different people's eyes. How did Peter see it? How did Mary see it? How did the thief on the cross see it? And one of them was Barabbas. And as I, look, as I looked into it, I realized there's a lot more there than can be fit into one portion of a lesson. So we're going to do an entire lesson on looking at Barabbas. And we're going to start by, we're going to look at a couple of different characters surrounding the story of Barabbas. We're going to start by looking at how Barabbas took the pass in this story. Barabbas took the pass. Um, again, all the points have to start with the same letter because my grandfather will come in and whip me. Um, and he lives hours away. He'll just show up somehow. It was a custom in uh, Roman society that around this time, this was during the Passover, and around this time, every year they would release one prisoner as a sort of goodwill offering, a way of saying that we believe in second chances, we believe in rehabilitation. It's a way of saying that one bad choice doesn't ruin your life forever. You can be released. And so around this time, Jesus was being crucified, and um, most of us know the story of Pilate, who said, I, have not, I find no wrong in him, now take him and crucify him. But Pilate tried a little bit harder than that to get Jesus released. He said, it's the Passover, so we can release a prisoner. And so Pilate said, here's Jesus, who his only crime, his technical crime, why he was being crucified, was he claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed a position that he didn't have. Um, for the Jews, that was claiming to be the Messiah. For the uh, Romans, that was claiming to be the Son of God, which was a status that was reserved for the emperor. Um, and so 
here's Jesus, whose only crime is saying that he's something that he's not. And here's Barabbas, a convicted murderer, someone who kills without empathy, without sorrow, someone who doesn't think about other people's lives, one of the worst criminals that we have. Which one do you want us to release? When you set up that kind of dichotomy between the two, it makes it all the more shocking that the Jews chose to release Barabbas. Now, for us today, that's not surprising because we know the story. Um, sometimes I'm jealous of people who grow up in a society without Christianity and then get to learn the story of the Bible because they get to learn all the twists and the shocks that come with it. They don't know from the beginning that Jesus is going to rise from the dead. I remember hearing a story of someone who lived on a small island uh, called Bonaire. And he was reading the Bible for the first time. And when he got to the part where Jesus died, he threw his Bible across the room and started crying, saying that's not how it's supposed to end. Because he didn't know the story. We know the story. So for us, it's not surprising that Barabbas is released. But if you don't know what's coming, it's shocking. It's something that none of us expect. You know, here's someone who told a fib. Jesus didn't, but that's the crime that he was being crucified for. Here's someone who said something that wasn't true. And here's someone who took the most sacred gift humanity has ever been given, the gift of our life, the gift of, I guess the most sacred gift we have is the soul, but um, the, he took the gift of human life that God's given all of us. Which one do you want to release? The person who said that he was the son of God or the person who has killed and likely will again if we release him into society. And they said, we want Barabbas released. Then in uh, verse 23 of Matthew, we read Matthew uh, chapter 27 is the story of Jesus' crucifixion. We read verses 15 and 16. Uh, now at the feast of the governor was, a, now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And so um, the choice is given to the crowd, and they choose to release Barabbas. In verse 23 of this chapter, Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? Talking about Jesus. What evil has Jesus done to be worse than Barabbas? And, at that t and they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. They didn't even know. They didn't even have an answer for what Jesus had done so bad. They just wanted him crucified. Um, okay, I have to explain this a little bit before I sound like a really horrible person. Um, I'm a psychology major, and so I study psychology, and one aspect of that is criminal psychology, which is the study of people who commit crimes and why they do that. Um, it's the study of the brain, often the deficiencies in the brain that can lead people to having those kinds of drives. So one of the most interesting things to study in criminal psychology is the, um, the concept of serial killers. Uh, because a lot of them have what's called uh, sociopathy, or psychopathy, where they don't feel empathy. Um, and so I've studied a lot of serial killers over the course of my life because I want to learn more about how their brains work. One of them was a man by the name of Edmund Kemper. And I'll try to keep this as clean as possible, but his crimes, if you ever look them up, they are truly heinous. Um, over the course of a few years, he killed 10 people, including his mother and his grandparents. Uh, he was finally arrested on April 24th, 1973. And in an interview that someone had with him, he said that his end goal was to kill his mother. That was what he was building up to. And everyone else that he killed was just a proxy for her. It was just people that he could project his mother onto and take out that aggression. And he said, and I wish I had the actual word-for-word -word quote with me, but I don't. But he said, basically, I feel bad for those people, but I needed to accomplish something. And they served that role better dead than alive. That is a blatant disregard for human life, and it is sickening to think about. And that's the kind of person... Barabbas was. We don't have brain scans or diagnostics here, so we don't know if Barabbas was a psychopath or not. But Barabbas was a serial murderer. He was the kind of person who didn't feel empathy. 
He looked at people and didn't see who they were or what they could do, but saw what can they accomplish for me? And can they accomplish that better dead or alive? And that's the kind of person that the Jews released instead of Jesus. We all see ourselves in Barabbas in the story of the cross. Granted, I doubt any of us have committed crimes that bad, but we've all committed sins. We've all done things that we know are against God's will. We've all done things that because of that, we don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve what um, God has given to us. But we're allowed to take the pass on that. Just like because Jesus was crucified, Barabbas was able to be released. Because Jesus is crucified, we are allowed to be released from eternal torment. We're not given that, or we have the choice at least to not have that. So the first point is that Barabbas took the pass. The second thing that I want to talk about is how Jesus took the punishment because of this. Um, the cross that Jesus was crucified, there are three different types of crosses that were used in crucifixion. This one was the most agonizing of all of them. Um, we as humans, as a race, are really good at hurting each other. Um, it is something that we have perfected over millennia. We are really good at causing pain to other people. And nothing accomplished that quite as well as the cross that Jesus was crucified on. Um, I could tell you about some manners of torture that would make you sick to your stomach. You guys are probably wondering, why did we ever let this guy talk to our youth? Um, I've looked into some methods of torture because I wanted to know how painful was the cross compared to other methods of torture. I wanted to know what did Jesus go through and was it really as agonizing as people make it out to be? And sparing you the details, I can tell you, yes, it was. It was the most agonizing thing that anyone in humanity has, can go through. We talk about the nails that were driven through the cross or through his hands. Um, it's a bit of a mis uh, a misunderstood concept there. It wasn't necessarily through his hands as much as it was in the middle of the two bones here. Because if it was through his hands, the weight of his body would have pulled him out. He had to put it somewhere where he could hold himself up using his bones. That's just one example of the pain that was inflicted on the cross. I'm not going to go into it all the way because we don't need to talk about all that. But Jesus went through a lot. And it's even more sobering to realize he didn't deserve that death in the first place. He didn't deserve a humane death. They didn't have guns back there, but one of the most humane ways that someone can be killed is gunshot to the brain. Because you're killed immediately. There's no pain involved in that. If they had that, that would have been the most humane way of dying, apart from a fast-acting and painless poison. But Jesus didn't even deserve that, much less this agonizing torture. He didn't deserve any of that, but he took it anyway so that Barabbas could be released. He took it anyway so that we could be released. We have a concept here in America, um, it's in the Eighth Amendment, uh, that we call cruel and unusual punishment. And it's the idea that you, know, you don't chop off someone's arm because they stole a stick of gum. You know, the punishment has to fit the crime. You have to make sure that whatever someone did, they get what they deserve for that, not, a, not way more than they deserve. Um, and really, there's not a universal definition of what cruel and unusual punishment means. Um, and this is what a lot of lawmakers and judges don't want to tell you. No one knows what cruel and unusual punishment is. No one knows what defines it. But the best we can say is more than what was deserved for the crime. It's a concept called retributive justice, coming from the same word as retribution, that the punishment that's fair is the one that is the same scale as the crime that was committed. We might know this as the concept, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, which if you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus doesn't quite approve of that concept either. Um, it's a concept that, you know, if you poke out someone's eye, they get to poke out your eye. If you accidentally cut off someone's hand, they get to cut off your hand. You get back what you dish out. Um, in fact, if any of you have ever heard of uh, the 
the ancient king Hammurabi who had the famous Code of Hammurabi, it was based around that entire idea that the punishment for a crime is of equal scale to the crime that was committed. Jesus committed no crime. Jesus did nothing wrong. He claimed to be the Messiah and the Son of God, and he was both of those things. And yet he took a punishment far worse than anyone deserved. And so Barabbas took the pass, and Jesus took the punishment. But we, as Christians, as followers of God, we take the prize from this. I was talking in the youth class about the dilemma of Bible study, which is that this is something that actually happened. This is actual history, and we have to be aware of that. We also have to be aware of the fact that this is preserved for us for a reason. And we have to find the balance between what did this say to the original audience and why does the Spirit want us to read this? What does it say to us? As I said before, we see ourselves in the role of Barabbas in this story. And I think that's the reason that the story of Barabbas was preserved for us all these years, because we are Barabbas. Jesus takes our place so that we can be elevated to his place. He should have been a free man. He should have been able to live his life. But because the Jews hated him so much, because they refused to listen to him, he had to die on the cross, and Barabbas was able to live his life. We don't know what happened to Barabbas afterwards. It's never told to us. But he was given a second chance. Jesus died so that Barabbas could have a second chance. And in the same way, Jesus died so that all of us can have a second chance. He took our place. He took all of our sins so that we can be elevated to his place. So that we can go to heaven. So that we can get a second chance and a third chance, and a fourth chance, and a hundredth chance. As many times as we are willing to honestly ask for forgiveness, God is willing to forgive us because Jesus took our sins. Because Jesus took our place on the cross. We don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve eternal life with God, but Jesus was the placeholder there. Jesus stepped in and he said, I will take on their sins so that they can live with you in heaven. Galatians 2, verse 20, um, it's a fun verse, there's a VBS song about it. It says, I've been crucified with Christ, it is not, no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. When Jesus died on the cross... He gave his life. And we often talk about our baptism, and we say that it's symbolic of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But sometimes we, you know, we say the words, but we don't really understand the meaning. When we are baptized, we die. The old man, the man filled with sin, or woman, the old person dies so that a new person can be born, a new person given life by Jesus. The death is when we renounce our sinful ways. The burial is when we are put into the water, and the resurrection is when we are brought back out a new person. Um, I'll admit this is probably one of the more depressing lessons that I have, because first off, we talk about serial killers and torture, and no one really enjoys talking about that, or at least no one admits that they enjoy talking about that. When we think about everything that Jesus sacrificed for us, we realize how much we don't deserve it. There's a bright side to it because, like I said, it's not just the death, it's the resurrection. Galatians 2.20 tells us that we are given new life through Jesus. We are allowed a new life because of what Jesus gave on the cross. Because Jesus gave his life, we get a chance at eternal life. One of my favorite sets of movies is the Indiana Jones series. Um, I was speaking at one congregation a few years back, and no one there had ever heard of Indiana Jones or the Princess Bride. And so I was very disappointed that the entire front row wasn't filled when the invitation was offered, because if you haven't seen the Princess Bride, there's a problem there. Um, but they'd never heard of Indiana Jones, and so I had to explain that in Indiana Jones, there's this section, or this part of the movie, where there's a little 
um, treasure on the altar, and Indy has to go up and he has to figure out a way to get it off without setting off the pressure plate. And so he does the, you know, the quick swap out maneuver where he pulls the idol off the altar and he puts a sack of sand there that's the same weight so that he can take it and the pressure plate's not active. He takes the prize and puts something else there instead. Another great example of a placeholder. And that's not the point of the story, but the point is at the end, Indy walks out with the treasure. He gets the prize. Um, and because it's an Indiana Jones movie, there are a thousand booby traps throughout the temple that he's looking through. But he gets the treasure. He gets the prize. When Jesus died on the cross, that wasn't for him. That, he didn't need to die on the cross. He lived a perfect life. That was for us. Because he knew that we couldn't live perfect lives. He knew that we were going to make mistakes. We were going to fail. And we were going to need his sacrifice. Jesus didn't die on the cross because he thought it would make a cool story. Jesus didn't die on the cross because that was what he wanted to do. If you remember the Garden of Gethsemane, he didn't want to do it at all. He was terrified of dying on the cross. He died on the cross because he knew that we needed him to. That's what this life is all about. It's about leading a life that honors that sacrifice. Because Jesus took the punishment, Barabbas was able to take the pass, and we as Christians are able to take the prize, the prize of eternal life with God if we are willing to give our lives to him. And so as we wrap up this morning, I just want to ask you a simple question. Which is, what are you doing about that prize? What are you doing to take hold of that prize? Because it's not just accept Jesus into your heart and you'll be saved. We have to lead lives that honor that sacrifice. We have to do things that show we care about the sacrifice that Jesus made. We have to give our lives to God because he gave his life for us. And so, if you need to make a change in your life, maybe you haven't given your life to God yet and you're ready to, or maybe you did and you haven't been living like you should have. Maybe you gave your life to God and you haven't been living the life that shows that. If that's you, then there's no reason to leave that unspoken this morning. There's no reason to leave this morning without having taken hold of that prize that Jesus gave to us. So, if that describes you, if there's any way that we can help you with that this morning, please come forward and make that known as we stand and sing.